Hi, my name is Neil Brideau. My pronouns are he, him. I run Radiator Comics, which distributes self-published and small press comics. We're joined today by cartoonist and educator Ryan Clater, who will be talking about his upcoming comic, A Hunter's Tale, for which Ryan is running a Kickstarter campaign through the end of January 2022. Um, today's video also includes a demonstration by Ryan on creating page layouts in the vector art program, Adobe Illustrator. We are recording today from Mikasuki land. The people from whom the land was stolen are still here and are still caring for this place. It's also important to acknowledge the history of African-American, Bahamian, Haitian, and other Caribbean people whose labor made South Florida what it is today. We have a lifelong responsibility to be better neighbors to the people and places where we're located and to work to dismantle white supremacy. Expressing one's ideas and feelings through comics and zines can be really powerful. And one of our hopes with programming like this video is to make those tools of expression more accessible. So thank you for watching. Um, Ryan Clater is the developer and educator, or sorry, um, Ryan Clater is the developer and coordinator of the comic art and graphic novel minor and assistant professor at Michigan State University where he teaches comics studio courses. Ryan's achievements have included five space prizes from the Small Press and Alternative Comics Expo, including the top prize, first place in the graphic novel category. As a creator, Ryan is known for his award-winning self-published autobiographical comic book series, And Then One Day, as well as his collaboration on Coin-Op Carnival, electrifying tales of mechanical contraptions, which he illustrated and co-wrote with Nick Baldridge. Ryan's international client list includes companies such as Moleskin, Stern Pinball, Verizon Wireless, Mr. Jones Watches, and more. His other artistic pursuits include designing uh, neon signs and more watches. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much, Neil. I appreciate being here, and thank you for making time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. For sure. Um, so A Hunter's Tale is a comic adaptation of a poem that your grandfather wrote. Um, and I was hoping that you could start off by telling us a little bit about the comic. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so my late grandfather, Charles Kermit Clater, wrote this poem almost 40 years ago. And this poem has resonated with me for a very long time. It's my, my absolute favorite poem that he ever wrote. And it's a very narratively driven visual type of poem. And I feel like I've been able to see this in my mind for a very long time. And only recently have I felt confident enough in my cartooning to attempt a project that was this important to me. Uh, I also think it comes at a really good time because thematically, this book is about um, reciprocated empathy, you know, seeing one another's sides, even though that can be very difficult sometimes. And uh, I think that those lessons of radical empathy are something that are sorely needed right now. So I'm so excited to share this work with people. Uh, I'm excited to uh, let people know about my grandfather's poem and share these visuals that I've been creating over the past few months. Nice. And uh, one of the ways that you're sharing, like getting it out there is um, through a Kickstarter campaign, which you're running to, to help fund the comic. Um, what should we know about your Kickstarter campaign? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, if you're looking for the campaign, you can go to ahunterstale.com and that'll take you straight to the campaign. Uh, but I can share my screen here and show it to you. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So this is the landing page that you'll see when you come to ahunterstale.com. And it tells you about the creators, which are my grandfather and I, as well as uh, some preview images of the book itself and some pages from the comic. So I'll just scroll through here a little bit more so you can get a taste of uh, what's in the book. And in just a little bit, I'm going to be giving a demo, as Neil mentioned, that's going to show how I started producing this page right here, page number two from the book, as well as page number three, this page that follows, um, using vector art to lay out panel structure and lettering. So uh, I hope that is of some interest to folks watching today. Well, yeah, and um, you, you mentioned that uh, 
that the the comic itself is about this like reciprocal uh, empathy, um, and uh, but it, it it does revolve around hunting, um, and for some people, hunting is like a fundamental part of their life and their culture, um, and for other people's people, it's an appalling act. Um, they don't understand why people would do it, um, and the comic does embrace the, like a pretty complicated um, view of hunting. And I was wondering uh, what your grandfather's relationship with hunting was, and may maybe also what your relationship with, with hunting is. Sure. That's, that's an excellent question. And I think you put it well that this theme of hunting does complicate this matter of empathy because it is kind of a polarizing um, subject matter. So I'll start by talking about my point of view and move on to talking about my grandfather's relationship with hunting. So uh, I am a big wuss. I do not like killing things. I do not like, um, I don't even like fishing, like, you know, an act that seems very relaxing, you know, hanging out on the boat. I don't like grabbing the fish. I don't like pulling a, fit, a hook out of its mouth. I don't even like threading the hook with a worm and just having it, rah, I can feel it in my hand, like wriggling around and it just, I, I don't want any part of it. Um, so that's my point of view, but there are many others, as you said. So my grandfather, his story actually complicates my view of hunting. And he grew up in the Midwest and was diagnosed with tuberculosis at a very young age. And which at the time, you know, in the early part of the 20th century was from my understanding, pretty much a death sentence. And so they told him, go off to the deserts of Arizona and cross your fingers that the dry desert air will dry out the TB and you will be cured, hopefully. Like who knows? Um, that was the cure, uh, the hopeful cure. And so he did that. He went out to Arizona and he was in the deserts, literally living off the land. And um, when he was out there, there was also a game warden present who, if they found out about him and where he was, they would have taken him away and put him in jail where obviously he wouldn't have been in the dry air where he needed to be. And uh, that would not have been good for him. So all this to say, um, he got really good at hunting. In fact, he could, he would only take one shot to hunt whatever he was eating that night. And if he didn't hit it, he did not eat because if he took a second shot, the warden would know where to start looking for him with the first shot they're you know, they don't know where the shot came from, but they'd be alert for the second one. So he never took a second shot. So he was an expert marksman and continued hunting throughout his life. Um, he lived several States away from me. So I was not present for most of this, uh, which is, probably partially why I'm a little removed from that act. Um, I do remember having venison when I would vi visit him, but uh, outside of that, I was never partial to hunting. Um, even into, you know, my uh, adolescent years, uh, I, I had a buddy who had a, a horse farm and I would go play with him. And at a surprisingly young age, he was given a BB gun. Well, surprising to me, like I said, I'm a big was. And <laughs> there was this giant uh, barn full of shavings and that was used for tending the horses, but there were some nesting pigeons in this barn and you know they would poop on the shavings and that was not okay. So uh, he was charged with shooting these pigeons. And we went out there one time together and he told me what was going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wasn't saying much of anything, but I'm like, I really don't want to do this. And he said, uh, here, you want to try? And he hands me this gun. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I pointed up at the pigeon and I purposefully aimed to the right. <laughs> so it hits this tin roof and makes a huge sound and the pigeons, you know, flutter away. And I'm like, you know, oopsies. <laughs> He's like, what'd you do that for? I'm like, oh, sorry, I must have missed. But I have just never been able to get in that headspace. And I understand that I exist in a privileged position to be able to say that. But um, yeah, I, I do think that this theme of hunting complicates nicely this theme of reciprocated empathy.
Yeah, and um, I, I guess it would be great to to know more about your grandfather. Um, in the comic, you mentioned that that this is um, part of a body of poems that that he left, um, and 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 that it, like the fact that he did at one point um, subsist on hunting is is really useful information in the context of the the comic. Um, so yeah. To, uh, Tell me about Charles Kermit Clater. Yeah, so um, I remember visiting him when I was very young, as you saw in that picture on Kickstarter, and um, those those are those are my memories of him. Uh, he lived next to a river, uh, very much like you see in that first illustration. We would go intertubing down the river, um, uh, just you know, riding the rapids. Um, we would go snowmobiling in the winter time. And I was talking to my dad about his dad, Charles Kermit Clater. And um, he was reminding me of things like uh, he just loved to laugh and he would always tell jokes and was always laughing. Even at his own jokes, he would just crack up and just really had a positive outlook on life. And uh, yeah, I, I'm... I feel honored to be able to put his work in many more people's hands many years after, you know, he's left us. Yeah, what well, I, I guess, what was that like to, to like make a comic adaptation of a poem where um, you knew the person who, who made the, the poem, but they're, they're not there necessarily to, you know, give feedback on your interpretation of what, what he wrote. Yeah, it was a lot of mixed feelings, actually. Um, you know, on one hand, I feel so passionately about this poem and want so much to visualize it and share it with more people. So I was very excited in that respect. In the other respect, like you said, my grandfather's not with us anymore, and I can't ask him questions. You know, this is coming off of a project where I was speaking with a hundred year old man, Wayne Nyans, who designed many of these games behind me. And I was in contact with him uh, every other week or so when we were doing this and asking him historical questions about his time in the coin op industry. And so I, I would love to call up my grandfather and ask him questions, but that, that wasn't possible. I would occasionally do that by proxy through my father. And um, one of the things I was very adamant about is that nothing in the poem changes. I did not change any words. Everything is uh, as it was in his poem. I, I just made that decision very early on because even if there was uh, something that I felt may have been massaged a little bit to, to make it fit the form, I, I just made the decision, uh, it's gonna be the poem verbatim and I'm going to uh, work within that. So uh, I tried my best to uh, really stay true to my grandfather's words. And uh, yeah, so I, like I said, some mixed emotions in there for sure. Cool, well, it's a beautiful comic. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I'm sure that, that he would enjoy such a such a thing um so uh, i appreciate that yeah yeah for sure um i feel like now is a great time to present your tutorial on creating page layouts using adobe illustrator um is there anything that we should know before we we jump into layout land i don't think so i i, I tried to start from the very beginning you know more or less a blank canvas talking about laying out the page and you'll see it as it comes up here cool awesome what Let's do this. Here we go. OK. OK, so first of all, thank you to Neil and Radiator Comics for giving me this opportunity to talk about this new project that I'm so excited about, A Hunter's Tale. But with that said, I'd also like to chat with you guys about how this particular book was made through the use of vector art to lay out comics pages and how I've made a lot of my work in the past. This is really the way that I go about doing it, and it was actually a conversation in the Radiator Comics open studio sessions with uh, another creator who was saying, 
that sounds interesting. Uh, I'd love to see how that happens. So I'm glad to finally document it here for not only the Radiator Comics community, but the internet at large. So let's go ahead and get into it here. Okay, so I think we've pretty well established who I am and what this project is that I'm working on. But for this demonstration today, I wanted to talk about how I go from nothing to something on a page of comics, but more specifically talking about comics layout as it has to do with vector art. So I'm going to take a page from my new book here, A Hunter's Tale. And let's take a look at, this is page number two, okay? And I'm choosing this because it has a relatively simple panel layout and no text. We'll get into some layouts with text uh, in a little bit, but I wanted to start off with a relatively simple layout. So I wanted to also kind of rewind the clock here a little bit. Like how did this page come to be? So before it was fully rendered and colored, it was simply inks. But before I inked it, I penciled the page, which you're probably familiar with. If you make comics, uh, you move from pencils to inks. And this was penciled on my tablet. I have a Microsoft Surface Pro, and that's where I do most of my penciling. And uh, prior to that even, this <laughs> is what I want to talk to you about today, how you create comic book layouts in a vector art program. For example, Adobe Illustrator. Now, before we get too far into this lecture, I want to make a bit of an outline for you so you know what to expect for the rest of this demonstration. So we're talking about comics layout using a vector art program, and I'll be using Adobe Illustrator. So we're going to start off with vector comics layout basics. And the thing that we're going to create first is page two from this project that I've mentioned, A Hunter's Tale. And we're going to take about 20 minutes to go over custom page sizes, grid structure, setting that up, and then also outlining your gutters, where all those are going to go. So we're doing a pretty simple page layout to begin with. But then after we go through that, we're going to take another page and talk about expediting your vector comics layout. Now that's only going to take about 15 minutes or so, and we're going to do that with the subsequent page from A Hunter's Tale. And we're going to go over things like lettering placement as well as templatizing your workflow in order to expedite this process. Now, even before this happens, I'll start sketching in a notebook and try to figure out what this thing, what this page is going to look like. And my page two looked something like this. It's a really horrible drawing. I hesitate to even show this to you, but here it is. This is how uh, ideas in my head start getting to be ink on paper. And I use this to figure out, okay, do I need X number of panels? How big do they need to be? And ultimately this was the sketch that I used to move forward with. Okay, so now that we have that established, let's go ahead and hop into Adobe Illustrator. So once you have the Adobe Illustrator environment up and running, the first thing it's gonna ask you is what kind of a document you want. And you can simply go ahead and press letter size. It doesn't really matter because we're going to create our own custom page size in here. So once I press create, then it's going to show us this letter sized paper, which is eight and a half by 11 inches tall. Okay, again, doesn't really matter because you have a very specific size comic that you are going to work with. Now for my book, I had a very odd size. It was going to be, and I'm going to grab this rectangular tool here and click on the artboard. And when you click on the artboard, it asks you what width and height do you want? So I simply input my width, which for this book was four and an eighth by five and a quarter inches tall. And when I say okay, it creates that page. Okay, so once you grab your selection tool or black arrow tool in Illustrator, you can move this around as you see fit. Okay, so here's our page. Um, when we make a page of comics, typically we have some sort of a grid structure on the page, which means the outside edges, not of the page, but of the panel borders themselves. So where does that panel border sit? Typically, I have about a half inch by half inch margin around the outside of my pages. So I'm going to make another box. I'm just going to click once. And instead of 4.125 inches by 5.25 inches, I'm going to tell it to be 0.5 inches by 
0.5 inches. I'll say okay. And this just acts as a little bit of a template, okay? I'm going to grab this thing by the anchor point. Now, it tells me, anchor, right up here. You can see it in pink. I can grab that by the anchor point and know that that is the point from which I am moving it if I have Smart Guide selected. Now, if you don't see that, you can always go up to View Smart Guides, and if it is unchecked, go ahead and check it, and then you'll see those little helpful hints that pop up, okay? Like, hey, you're on a path, or you're on a center point, or you're on an anchor point, okay? So because you see these smart guides popping up, I know, hey, I'm on a path, or it's snapped to an intersection point. I know it's at the very top left of that page. Okay, so now I've got one portion of my uh, margin set, the top margin and the left-hand margin. Now on the bottom margin, uh, do a little bit of thinking about your page layout. Will you be including page numbers? If so, you probably don't want to jam them right up to the edge of the page, so I will typically give myself a little bit more room on the bottom of the page than I will on the sides and the top. So I'm going to make another 0.5 inch width, but I'll probably bump it up by maybe an eighth of an inch. So I'll say 0.625 for the bottom margin. So you can see that's just a little bit taller, an eighth of an inch taller than that other template that I made. Okay, great. So now I can get to work putting that in place. There we go. And now I simply drag out a rectangle from anchor point to anchor point, and I have a perfectly constructed grid structure uh, that has a 0.5 inch, 0.5 inch, 0.5 inch margin all the way around, except for the bottom, which has a 5 eighths inch margin on the bottom to account for the page number. Okay, so speaking of that page number, I'm just going to go ahead and put in a page number. I'll type in the number two, and you can highlight it and tell it to be any particular size you want. I'm gonna go ahead and make mine a five point font. And then using the move tool, I'll go ahead and move it into place. Again, aligning with a center, make sure that text is centered, and it is so. Okay, there's my page number, okay? I don't know about you, but I feel like that fits a little bit nicer than if there was just a half inch margin here. It feels like um, that page number was accounted for instead of being jammed in after the fact, okay? All right, so moving forward, how are we going to construct this additional layout with Adobe Illustrator? Well, essentially we need to lay in some gutters, and gutters are the space between the panels. So how wide are your gutters going to be? Now, the beautiful thing about working with Adobe Illustrator is that you can make these margins whatever you want, um, just like we made this page size whatever we want it to be. Now, if I were you, I would go to your favorite comic book and see what the margin size is, like physically take out a ruler and measure that space between the panels. You know, what size, margin, space, gutter, do you like? Uh, maybe it's a quarter inch, maybe it's a sixteenth of an inch, maybe it's around an eighth. That's about what I go for, is around an eighth of an inch. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a new rectangle. Now check this out. I'm going to make one that is, you guessed it, an eighth of an inch wide, and then I'm just gonna make it the height of my page, which was 5.25. Okay, now we're gonna get a really tall, skinny rectangle, and if it pops up like a black rectangle uh, and that looks strange to you, you can always change your attributes right over here in the default fill and stroke button so it looks like it has a white fill black stroke, okay? Just like gutters typically do. Now, um, I am also going to copy this, so select that big, tall rectangle, and I'm going to go up to edit and pull down to copy, Likewise, I'm going to go back up to edit and pull down to paste to make another one. And you see a second one appear. Now, what I'm gonna do with the second one is simply rotate it. Now, if I go up to the top corner bounding box, you can rotate your shapes. And if you hold down shift, it's going to constrain your rotation to 
45 degree angles. Okay, so I rotate it until it is horizontal and then I'm gonna move it up here above the um, uh, page. So maybe you can see what's gonna happen from here. Essentially, I'm remembering that awful <laughs> sketchy layout that I did. I'll pull that up right here for you now. So you can see that and I'm trying to conceptualize, okay, there is a relatively large panel at the top. It's not right in the middle, it's not half, but it's larger than the others. So I will move that to, so that there's a majority of room in the upper portion. Then it looks like there's a series of three panels in the middle grid and then a final smaller uh, tier of one panel, okay? So I need another one of these things. If I need another gutter, all I need to do is go back up to edit and pull down to copy, back up to edit and pull down to paste. Now, what you may see is that there are some quick keys associated with these menu options, control C, control V. So that's what I'm gonna do from here on out. If you see something magically happen, it's probably because I used a quick key. So if you select this rectangle, you can press control C, I just copied it, then control V, that pastes it. Now you've got another one to use. And I'm going to move that down so that it roughly mirrors my sketchy layout that I showed you, okay? All right, so we have our tiers created. One, two, three tiers of comics on this first page. The next thing we want to do is to create those vertical gutters so that we have those three equal tiers here. All right, so I'm going to take uh, this uh, gutter and I'm going to copy and paste it, copy, paste. I have another one to work with. And this is too tall. I do not need it intersecting the entire page. I am just going to uh, resize it, uh, zoom back out, so that it is roughly the height of that tier. Resize the bottom, so it's roughly the height of the tier. And you might be thinking to yourself at this point, self, I think I could just copy and paste this thing, right? Okay, copy, paste, and there's another one. And here are our three panels, but they are not quite equal, right? Okay, so we could get in here and sort of fudge things around until we have something that looks reasonable, but this is not accurate. And if you're anything like me and like most comics artists, you're a bit particular. <laughs> so I really want a series of panels that are democratic, that every panel occupies the same space, occasionally, depending upon the pacing that I want in my comic. But in this portion, I really wanted this equal series of panels here. So I want to show you a super handy way to make equally spaced panels across your page. And this can work for vertical panels, horizontal panels, whatever you want. So I'm going to take one of these rectangles, one of these gutters, and I'm going to grab the outside. You can see how it says path right here, okay? I'm going to move that so that it intersects the outside of my panel's grid structure. Now I'm gonna take the other one and move it over as well, okay? Once I have these sitting on the outside edges of my grid structure, I'm going to use a tool called the blend tool. And I'd like to show you a couple different ways this thing works first before we start using it on the page. Now, typically this blend tool was made to blend two different shapes together. So let's say for instance, you have a star and you want to blend it into a different shape, like, I don't know, a rectangle, okay? Simple. I'm going to assign these shapes a particular color And now that I've assigned them a color, I can go to the blend tool and click on one shape and then the other, and you'll see it blend from one to the other, okay? Now, how does this have to do with comic book layout? Well, let me explain this to you in a couple different ways. So again, we talked about how this moves from one shape to another. I'm gonna grab this star once again and make sure that my and make sure that my rectangle 
is a different color. Okay, so now that we have the same situation set up all over again, I'd like to show you a different way this can work. So click on one shape, then the other, they blend together just like before, but check this out. If you double click the blend tool button, one, two, then it brings up the blend tool dialog box, the options for the blend tool. And you have a couple different ways to make this work. One is smooth color, and the other is specified steps. So once I click on that, it's telling me that this, in theory, smooth transition is actually made up of 251 different steps. Now we can cut the number of steps down to, let's say, two or three or five or eight or whatever we want. Uh, I'm just gonna put in the number four and say okay. And look what's happening. You can see the shape as it morphs and changes. And you can see those one, two, three, four different iterations that we've created. Okay, again, how does this have to do with uh, comic book layout? Well, what if we made a couple of different shapes? But what if those shapes were the same thing? And we tried to blend it using specified steps. Click on one shape, then the other. Voila, you have a blend, or actually a sequence of shapes. Now this rectangle has blended into this rectangle, but because they are identical shapes, the intervening shapes do not change shape as they have above. Okay, so let's clean up our canvas a little bit. I'm gonna get rid of all this. And my attributes for these rectangles are not colors, they are uh, white fill and black stroke. So when I use this blend tool and click from one to the other, aha, four steps in between. But how many steps do I need in between? In order to make three different panels, I need two gutters in between them. So now that I have this blend created, I'm simply going to go back to the blend tool with that blend selected, double click the blend tool to bring up the blend options, and change the number of specified steps from four to two. Say okay, and there is my Illustrator layout, okay? So we see that page layout that I wanted. We see the exact spacing that we need. Now, traditionally, this would require a lot of math to get just right. You can't just find, uh, you know, the midpoints or the tripoints or the quad points here, and then, you know, you'll have to find a uh, 16th of an inch out from that on one side and a 16th of an inch on the other to make an eighth of an inch and then do the same thing on the other side. Oh, it just gets way too complicated to do. So this makes your job super easy. Now, this looks like doo-doo, right? It looks like a bunch of bars laid across a page. But what you want is something nice and clean that looks like a page of comics. So here's how we're going to do that. First thing, we're going to select all of these gutters. I've selected each horizontal and each vertical bar, and I'm going to go to the Pathfinder palette. Now, if you don't see the Pathfinder palette in your list of palettes here, you can always find all of them in the Windows menu. Windows menu. And if it is unchecked, it means you are not looking at the Pathfinder palette. I am, so it's checked. So I'm gonna grab this Pathfinder palette and just bring it right out here so we can see this a little bit easier. Now there are a lot of different ways that you can make shapes interact with one another in Illustrator using the Pathfinder palette. And that first one is the Unite Shapes. That means if you have two different shapes, let's say, you know, it could be anything. It could be a rectangle and a circle or an oval. If you select these two shapes and click the Unite button, they join together to create one new shape, okay? So now that you know how the Pathfinder tool works a little bit, let's go back to those gutters and select all of them. I've selected the horizontal and the vertical gutters, and I'm going to click the Unite button. That did not change anything, and here's the reason why. Because these shapes are still a blend. 
this was a shape and this was a shape, but this is just blend is figuring out how to make these shapes move from one to the other, okay? Now, before we join all these shapes, we need to tell the blend, hey blend, please expand these shapes, okay? You want to expand the object, not the fill and the stroke. We just want the objects to be objects, not blends. So I'm gonna say okay. And now each of these are their own shape. They all highlight at once because they are still grouped. That doesn't matter. But you can see that each of them are individual shapes. And if you really wanted to, you could get in here and change the way each individual shape looks without changing the look of the others, okay? So they really are independent of one another. Okay, with that said, let's select the vertical gutters and the horizontal gutters all at once. And now that we have everything selected and expanded for the blend, we can click on that Unite function and they all form one shape. Okay, what are we gonna do with this ladder looking shape? Well, we are going to use it to cut a hole in this rectangle. Remember we made this grid structure for our page? We are going to use this like a cookie cutter. So again, let me try to explain real quickly here. If we have two shapes, let's say a square and a circle, if we select both shapes and use the minus front pathfinder selection, it's going to act like a cookie cutter where the top shape is going to cut a hole in the shape that is behind it. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this and you'll see it looks like a cookie cutter. It looks like the top shape cut a hole in the back shape. That's exactly what happened. Okay, so that's how that works in a simple way. Now we are going to grab both the grid structure, remember that rectangle that we created for the outside of our panel borders. And then we're also going to select the gutters that we've created. Now the gutters are on top so that if we click that minus front option, it's going to act like a cookie cutter and cut a hole in that grid structure. Now, when I deselect, I think you can see, ah, I have a perfectly, delete, created, delete, panel structure for my comic. I know those gutters are exactly an eighth of an inch. I know that center tier has panels that are exactly the same size as one another because I use that blend tool, right? Super powerful. So at this point, what I do is I take this and I save this page as a bitmap file that I will then place into my digital penciling program. Uh, the program that I use is Clip Studio Paint, and then I can digitally pencil on top of that. Once I'm done, I will print out that page of digital pencils. I'll do a little additional penciling. Uh, I, I like doing my small detail work in uh, an analog method rather than digitally, because I don't know, you can get really down into the minutia when you zoom, 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 zoom digitally, and then you end up printing it out and you just can't see that detail. So that's why I like to finish up my pencils in an analog way. And once I'm done with these uh, analog pencils, I will hand ink everything hand ink the panel borders, hand ink the lettering, hand ink the penciled characters and environment and everything else. And then once I'm done, I will scan it back into the computer, threshold out everything so that it's just black and white pixels, flat the artwork, which means just outlining all the colors, and then coloring the artwork with finished colors. And then I'm done with that page. But it all starts with these fundamentals of sketching out a thumbnail image and realizing that very sketchy, rough thumbnail image in a more finalized form by figuring out your page size, your margin widths, and finally your gutter dimensions and placement. Okay, so that's my working method. And I know that we didn't really have letters on this page. So I wanted to go into a few things. One is lettering, but two, how can you expedite this workflow 
even better. I'd like to get into that a little bit here. All right, so I'm gonna move this out of the way and uh, get rid of some of these things because I'd like to show you a page. All right, here's that page we just created, right? Um, but let's say we're starting from scratch, okay? We don't need these uh, horizontal gutters. We don't need these vertical gutters. All we need is a new page. So let's say we're going to make page number three. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to highlight that number, change it. Now I know we're working on page number three. I do not need these template margin things anymore, so I'm gonna get rid of those. And then now I'm ready to start working on another page. So at this point, I'd like to show you what page number three looks like. Okay, so here is the finished page number three from A Hunter's Tale, this new book of mine. And again, I'd like to sort of play to you in reverse order how this comes to be. So on the previous step, we have inks. And when we take those inks away, you see the pencils that came before it. And once again, that was digitally penciled on my tablet. But before that, we had the vector layout. Okay. Now this is the vector layout, but again, I want to emphasize the fact that this comes only after thumbnail exploration of scripting and how this script will be shown visually. All right, so page number three is where the words start to come in. So I have a script of my grandfather's poem. That's That was the basis of this comic. And when I start putting in words, I will highlight the uh, portion that I need, copy it, and then I'll go back to Adobe Illustrator where on my lettering layer, I have an existing piece of text. It doesn't matter what it is, but what does matter is that I've sized it appropriately. So this text is a six point font and that's the exact size that I want my font to print. You know, I've done prior tests and I know what I want, so there it is. And I even have templates like speech balloons, uh, if I need to put some text inside a balloon, okay? So at this point, I am going to use the type tool to paste that text. Now you'll see that text looks a little bit different, or maybe you don't, because it's very small. Uh, let me show you. Here is the uh, comic book font text in six point font that I already have. Here is something completely different. So I'm going to grab the selection tool to select that text and then use the eyedropper tool to click that prior text, bonk, and then you'll see the new text form the same attributes as that template text. Okay, so there we go. Now I can start grabbing that text and moving it to where it needs to be, but not before laying out the panels. Now, if you remember what page three looked like, I'll bring up a little image of the thumbnail here. There were four equal panels across the top. That's going to be a small tier up top, and then we have a couple of larger tiers down below. So again, I could start making these gutter rectangles all over again, or I could simply have a layout tier where I have equally spaced gutters, horizontal, and vertical all ready for me. So what I've done here is to simply make a gutter. And if you recall my gutters, I, I make mine uh, 0.125 inches. And for the width, I'm gonna say uh, 4.125, the width of the page, just a little overkill. And what I did to make these is to line up these gutters. You know, I grab the edge, I align it with the edge of my grid structure, and then I'll take that same gutter and duplicate it onto the bottom and blend the two of them together. So using the blend tool, I will click the top and then the bottom, and you see it form X number of intervening shapes, okay? So that works fine for the three equal tiers, right? So I could pull that over here. You see that is essentially what I did and then uh, contracted it so that it doesn't take up quite as much space and I can pull over whatever I want. But in these other cases, you'll see I did that with one 
division or one, two, three divisions. And I can simply grab these and pull these over holding down the shift key to make sure that it lines up with the grid structure once again. And once that happens, I pull it out to what it needs to be. And there is my equal grid structure. Now, this grid structure needs to be unequal. <laughs> so I am going to use that old expand trick. Remember if I go up to object and pull down to expand, it brings up the expand dialog box. And remember all I want to expand is the object itself. Okay, just the object. I say, okay. If you expand the fill and the stroke, each one of those things are going to become their own objects and that's not what you want. So just stick with object, okay? So now we have separate objects. However, if I click it, it still moves as one shape. So what do we do to ungroup these? Well, we can simply go up to object, ungroup, and if you find yourself doing this a lot, the quick key is shift control G, and that ungroups your object. So now if you click away or deselect by clicking on a blank area of the artboard, you can grab one of these and move it to wherever you want. So now that's going to be a rather short tier of panels and then a larger tier of panels, uh, a singular panel. And then I'm probably gonna use the keyboard just to ding, 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 ding. Move this down just a little bit you can move it by pixel increments if you use the arrows on your keyboard. And that's about what I'm looking for on page number three. Now, I want four equal panels up along the top tier. How do I do that? Well, I did the same thing I did horizontally, vertically up above. And because they're already created, I don't even need to think about just dragging that right down into place. And voila, four equal tiers. Super, super easy, right? So at this point, you guys know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to use the Pathfinder tool to join all these things. Oop, there is a uh, blend right here. You can see it because when I selected it, it has that line running through it. We do not want to blend, so I'm going back up to object and pulling down to expand. What all do we expand? Just the object. Say okay. And now we can grab all of the gutters Okay, I'm going to grab everything and then deselect by holding down shift and deselecting just the page and the exterior panel border, boink. Now all I have selected are the gutters. So in the Pathfinder, I click Unite. Now all the gutters are united, which allows me to then select the exterior panel border. And once all that is selected, I simply minus front, and voila. There we have our very precise grid structure. Now, on this page, I also have some text. So I'm just going to uh, grab that text, and at this point, I only need the first line. So I'm gonna grab my type tool, oops, my type tool, and only select that first line. I'm going to press cut, which is control X, and then paste it into place on that lettering layer. And that, oopsies, that is a very long piece of text and I would like it to be cut in about half. So I'm simply going to carriage return. And usually when text is inside a speech balloon, I want it centered, but I'm going to highlight everything and left justify it uh, since it's going to be sitting in a left justified narration box. Okay. So I need to make a narration box. I'm simply going to grab the uh, rectangle tool and make a rectangle around this text. And if it's snapping to areas that you do not want, you could always turn off that smart guide, but I think I'm gonna be okay with this, just for demonstration purposes anyway. And I'll dink that into place. So I've got roughly a letter's width distance between the text and the balloon wall, or in this case, the narration box wall. And then I can move that into place. Now here's another option for you to get pretty accurate with your layout. You might just toss this in here willy nilly, but I like to make sure that my margin between the narration box and the panel border is the same as the gutter itself. 
Now the width of the gutter, if you recall, was 0.125 inches. That's one eighth of an inch. So what I'm gonna do is create a little template square that is 0.125 inches by 0.125 inches. There, there it sits. Okay, now I'm going to take this and put it in the upper left hand corner. I know it's exact because it's intersecting with the anchor point there drop it. And now, check this out. If I uh, select my uh, narration box, I can grab it and move it right into place. Oopsies, forgot my text. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. Put that back into place. And now I have a very accurately placed narration box. That makes my inner control freak very happy. So I'm going to move on and do the same thing over here because this next one I would like to be right justified. So I'm going to take this piece of text, move it over here. Uh, I'm going to move it up. There we go. Now that I've moved it up, I can uh, carriage return and see what that looks like. It was a cold and frosty morn. I think I'm going to leave and on the top line. And this is still left justifying. I want it to be right justified. So I can do that. And once again, create that narration box. Oopsies, my attributes are getting screwy. There we go. So I will create that narration box. And move it to the background by clicking Control Shift Bracket. And you should be able to see it. And bring it back to the front if you Control Shift Other Bracket or simply Control Bracket. So there is that new narration box. I am going to place this so it does not look like it was just thrown over there willy nilly. Uh, I'm going to place it exactly where that template is. Uh, it seems as though I forgot the text again. So I'm just going to grab that text, move it into place right where it belongs, and all is right in the world. I think I need to expand that box just a little bit. Okay, there we go. Excellent. So there is my very precisely created comics layout using a vector art program like Adobe Illustrator. So now you understand how to create a page, how to create template boxes to make your very accurate margins, to make your grid structure, which you can then cut up using gutters, horizontal and vertical, that you create. And if you'd like to expedite your process for making this, you can always start making additional gutter templates that you can simply copy and paste into place to use as you see fit. So just to show you the reverse order of this, here is page three's thumbnail. Here is the vector art layout we just created. And I will put that into a digital penciling program, which I will then use to pencil on top of. And at that point, I print that out hand pencil, hand ink, scan back in, and color. And ultimately, here you have the final page three. Okay, so that just about does it. Uh, I hope this was helpful or maybe inspirational, <laughs> inspiring you to try this out on your own. And at the very least, maybe at least interesting. Uh, I've been told that this is kind of a different working method. I think I just cobbled this together after a number of years of working with these programs. I'm an educator and for many years I taught a number of different graphic design programs like Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, web tools, things of that sort. And so these programs were just like extensions of my body. And I, I had a hard time thinking of how to work without them. You know, I'd have ideas of how I'd want things to happen on the page and it was really difficult for me to get the accuracy that I wanted just using a ruler and pencil. But with a vector art program and these smart guides and very accurate ways to create objects, I found it very easy and I hope that you do too.
All right, that was really interesting. Um, thank you so much for for that tutorial. Uh, it's always fun to to like learn and see new tricks um, that hide in like these really complex and often intimidating programs like Illustrator. Um, and I wanted to follow up with one of the last things that you said, where you mentioned that you developed this process by using these programs over the course of years. Um, are there resources um, that you turn to to like learn about new tools that exist within programs like Illustrator or other like Adobe programs? Or um, do you have tips on getting to know programs or like recommendations for, for folks looking for tutorials similar to, to what you just presented? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I am still learning Adobe programs. They're so deep. And uh, just recently I got into video editing. Um, uh, it was sort of a trial by fire because I am a university professor and I'm used to getting up in front of the classroom and lecturing, but we couldn't do that over the past year and a half. So uh, it was a really quick, steep learning curve. And thanks to YouTube, anything I needed to know was there. Uh, I would just research, uh, you know, Adobe Premiere Pro or whatever I was doing at the time, uh, or how do you slow something down? Or how do you include two videos on top of one another? Or how do you crop something? Anything that I wanted to know, I would just search specifically for that. And chances are there's a number of different tutorial videos on YouTube. So thanks YouTube and all the content creators there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when back in my day, when I was learning Illustrator, uh, I sincerely had to take an entire semester long course in order to really understand Illustrator. Um, I knew Photoshop like the back of my hand, but when I tried to intuitively make the jump to a vector art program like Adobe Illustrator, I was lost. And now I feel like I could not exist without Illustrator. <laughs> it's just such a powerful program once you understand how that pen tool works. That's really the core of Illustrator. If you don't understand the pen tool, you don't really understand Illustrator. But once you understand those, you know, Bezier curves and, uh, you know, the handles and the anchor points and how you can manipulate them. It is so extraordinary, extraordinarily powerful. And on top of that, once you start using those smart guides, which tell you, okay, you're on a line, you're on an anchor point, you're on a midpoint, man, you can just use that to lay things out so quickly and accurately. It really, uh, makes my, my inner control freak happy <laughs> to be able to do things like that. Nice. So you, have you ever like stumbled upon some thing in, in the program? Um, do you ever learn that way by just like playing around with stuff and then like discovering De a, a, like a trick or? Definitely. I think that happens more easily in a program like Photoshop, uh, you know, rasterize program where there's different filters that basically you can just go through and try out and you see what they do. But in a vector art program like Adobe Illustrator, it's almost like you have to know a thing that you want to do and then figure out how to do it. Again, uh, I would imagine there's a plenty of YouTube tutorials on things like that these days, uh, but it took me a semester long course to really feel like I got that program under my belt. Yeah, um, it's, it's a very intimidating program when you don't know it. Um, so with the, the page three um, demonstration, you, you had like a lettering layer and you also had like the prepared layout layer um, ready to go. Mm -hmm. So that means that at some point you must have sat down and like taken some time away from like actually like making comics to create some sort of template document that you like open up every time that you want to lay out a new page, right? Um, can, can you talk about the, the value maybe of, and, and maybe also the drawbacks um, that you find in that sort of preparation before execution? Yeah, certainly. So uh, whenever I start a book, I will typically start thinking about format, size, how is this thing gonna be laid out? Is it portrait, landscape, big, small? Um, and I came across a book uh, called Traditions by Dua Chaka Her. And that was a um, companion book to Craig Thompson's uh, Ginseng Roots a little while back. 
And it was this very tiny four and an eighth by five and a quarter inch paperback book. It was only 16 pages long. And I just absolutely fell in love with the format for this book. And it's very, very oddly sized. It's not something you see every day. And so I literally took out a ruler and measured it and said, this is what I want. And so I made that page size template in Illustrator, as you saw, and I have on a number of different layers, the uh, gutter templates on each side, you know, the, the side and the top that I can pull down as I need. Uh, and I also have a lettering layer. So once I, as you saw, copy and paste the script into Adobe Illustrator, I can just quickly take that eyedropper tool and say, hey, be just like this text up here. And then it formats accordingly. You know, I have my text set as well to six point font for when it prints out at six point font, uh, which sounds small, but when you're working in all caps, it's plenty readable. Um, so yes, I will templatize the pages for every one of my books so that I don't have to whip out a sheet of Bristol and rule out every side of the page and every uh, panel border and grid structure. You know, that's that takes a lot of time and having that templatized saves a whole lot of time. Uh, you had a really good question, which is what are the drawbacks of that too? Um, so the panelization technique I use is pretty traditional, I would say. It's uh, mainly working in rectangular panel borders. Occasionally when I'm working in books, I'll negate a panel border and have you know a, a borderless panel or something like that, but I'm not going all J.H. Williams <laughs> third on this and making you know bat-shaped panels or anything. Um, so if there was a limitation to it, I'd say it's the uh, structuredness of that layout. Um, but again, you can break those constraints by just pulling out a single gutter and then changing them if you want something diagonal or pulling out a circle if you want an inset circle somewhere or um, any number of things. So uh, I don't know. I, I guess it's just the way my brain works is with Illustrator, but also in this very like regimented way, <laughs> this structured way, this uh, traditional rectilinear panel border structure by and large. Well, and with any sort of um, tool, you know, there's like, you start off super slow, like when you're learning and, and things feel awkward and, and clunky, but then once you like get to know the program, you can, it can you streamline your, your process. And then you can also sort of build on and maybe even experiment with like different, like, like different shapes and, and ways of laying out a program. For sure. Yep. Completely agreed. <laughs> cool. Well, um, thank you so much for this conversation and for the uh, great tutorial, Ryan. Um, so uh, A Hunter's Tale Kickstarter can be found at ahunterstale.com and um, it runs through the end of January, 2022. And that link will also be able to be found um, in the description below the video. So thanks everybody for watching and thanks again, Ryan Clater. Thank you, Neil. Cool, bye. <laughs>